Good morning, church. I want to encourage you to go ahead and have a seat. We're going to go ahead and do some announcements this morning. If you're new here, we want to welcome you. Thanks for coming today. And uh, we have a gift for you at the information booth. If you want to pick that up after the service, that would be great. I want to tell you guys about two new Sunday school classes that are starting up. Daryl Larson will be leading a seven-week class called Discover Your Shape in Room 107. Discovering Your Shape. I need to explain what that means. <laughs> this class will focus on determining your spiritual gifts. So it's a spiritual gifts class. It's something that Daryl has done before numerous times. And so um, that's in Room 107, the Truth Seekers class. And that uh, starts, I believe, today. Right, Daryl? today. Okay. And then also, uh, Freddie Harris and Bill Robertson will be leading a new study on the book of Galatians in the room right next to that, closer to the kitchen on the book of Galatians. Galatians is often called uh, the mini book of Romans. So it'll be really neat to go through the Galatians as we pick back up with Romans and uh, those will correspond to one another. So I want to invite you to those two Sunday school classes. If you don't go to one, um, these will be great ones to jump right into today. Well, um, there is a fundraising concert for Praise International, which is our ministry that um, Freddie Harris um, is a minister for, and that is going to be Friday, September 20th. Praise International is a ministry that ministers to pastors throughout the world. So it builds them up, lifts them up, and gives them resources. And so what they're going to do is they're going to have a fundraiser, which includes the worship choir, uh, youth choir, and other musicians from our church. Um, a love offering will be taken during the event, and it'll be a special night of worship and praise. Um, so it really goes well. Praise International Ministry will be praising the Lord. So there are invitations to invite other people. This would be a great thing to invite your friends and neighbors to, and there are invitations available at the information booth if you want to grab those and then invite people. That would be a wonderful thing to do. Well, we again want to... Um, just offer out there that we are having the quarterly business meeting potluck on September 29th. And um, we would love to answer some questions about the church and what's going on. If you have any questions about the church and what's going on, go ahead and write that down on your yellow communication card. Would really appreciate if you put your name on it and then put that in the chair. Just leave it in the chair. Uh, and that way we can discuss it uh, in that potluck meeting. So that's coming up on September 29th. Well, Awana, we uh, have a lot of people in this church who are involved in serving with Awana. There's a training meeting this Wednesday at 620. Um, and then the first club meeting, the first time Awana gets together is Wednesday, September 11th. If you haven't registered for that, uh, talk to Megan and go ahead and get registered for it. It's coming up very soon. So if you're, if you're on staff, please make sure you attend the staff training meeting this Wednesday. Okay, well, one of the things that I've actually already heard about this morning is the question, what are we going to do about men's camp? Um, people are beginning to think there might be some smoke associated <laughs> with men's camp, and, um, and they're right. So um, we are currently watching the fire up there. Um, as far as I know, the road is still closed even to get to camp. So we will make a final decision this week about men's camp, and we will let you know uh, this week on Facebook, and then uh, we will definitely let you know next Sunday for sure about it. But we're still saying go ahead and register uh, for it. Uh, we'll always just pay you back if we, if we cancel it. Um, and so we've been very optimistic, uh, but I will just say this, we're, we're really just trying to play it by ear. We're having a big meeting about it on Tuesday, and uh, we're going to try to figure that out uh, finally soon. Well, be sure to read your bulletin for detailed information on all the other great events that are going on. There are September newsletters in the information booth. This is a newsletter that tells you what's going on in the church. Just go ahead and grab one. It's a little bit deeper than the bulletin. Uh, there are offering boxes in the lobby for your gifts to the church. And um, we got a couple of announcements besides this today. So the first is Sarah Walden, and she's going to come tell us about Operation Christmas Child. So Sarah, come on up. Good morning. Ah, so I cannot believe it's already September. Like, 
Wow. <laughs> um, so Operation Christmas Child is coming up very, very quickly. You know, um, we collect the shoe boxes in November, but um, this year we're going to do something a little bit different um, for the shoe boxes. So uh, we're going to be having an all church packing party, excuse me, packing party on November 23rd. Um, so that's a Saturday. So everybody is invited to come to that packing party. We're going to have um, 300 shoe boxes uh, this year to pack there. So what that entails is um, we have a Christmas tree out in the lobby. I'm sure you guys probably noticed that this morning. Um, the Christmas tree has a lot of different ornaments on there. Each one of the ornaments on the back side has a sticker with some items that you could purchase and bring to the church to have um, to contribute for the packing party. So um, please feel free to take an ornament or two or three, whatever you would like. Um, I tried to make the, the amounts on the ornaments um, something fairly easy for folks to be able to do. But if, there's, uh, if you take an ornament for you know, 10 notebooks and you want to buy 50 notebooks, great. That would be wonderful. So um, whatever it is that you would, like to, you would like to provide, whatever God lays on your heart to do. Um, another thing that we need for the packing party is shipping funds. So each shoe box is $10, so do the math, that's $3,000 in shipping. So if you're able to contribute um, for, towards shipping, um, that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, you can do that by, um, on your check to the church. Um, if you want to put in the, the memo line OCC or for shoe boxes or packing party or whatever you would like, then that can be um, set aside for that shipping. Um, the other thing is, is that um, if you don't take an ornament or you're not able to contribute or, or anything like that this year, you are still welcome to come to the packing party. They're so much fun. Um, I've, I've done other packing parties at our church in Utah, and they're just a blast. So um, please feel free to come out and see what it's like. If you haven't ever packed a shoebox before, it'll be a great idea um, to be able to see what, what goes into packing the shoeboxes. Um, another thing, if you could please just keep in mind to pray, um, be praying for all of the shoe boxes, not only ours, but all of them that will be packed all over the, the country um, that are going to be going out. So um, to all the kids, there's lots of different things to pray about. Um, I have bookmarks that are prayer reminders if you would like, and um, feel free to hit me up for some of those if you'd like to remember that, put it in your Bible or something. Um, and then... Let's see here. Um, the items that you purchase for the shoebox packing party, if you could bring them to the church on November 10th. Um, we're still going to try to figure out a place to put those items, but um, I'm sure we'll figure it out. Um, but I would like to have those things ahead of time so that we can start getting things ready for the packing party itself, because it does take a bit of time to get things set up. And that leads me to if you're able to help. If you could help in any way, um, please let me know. Um, my phone number is on the bulletin, and it's also in the, um, the directory. So feel free to shoot me a text or give me a call, um, whichever I would love it if, if you're able to help. So that's about it. Thank you so much. Morning, church. You see quite a few of us around this morning with our blue camp shirts on, and we get to give you a quick update on how camp ministry went this summer. So Miss Marla and Miss Megan are going to start us off. Miss Marla is our program director for camp, and Miss Megan is our children's camp director. Oh, me. <laughs> Ooh, I get to go first. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, this year at camp, we had 43 kids come. Big number. Um, that's about twice what it was last year, which was pretty cool, and about half of those kids were our own kids, and then the other half were from different churches around the area. And then we also had quite a few volunteers from the churches come and help too, which was amazing because, well, we can't do it without the volunteers. Um, also, I wanted to give a special thank you to anybody who helped. If you could stand up real quick. Anybody who volunteered at camp? Helped at camp. Anywhere, yeah. Anywhere, anywhere. And if you didn't notice, we do have these blue shirts on. 
Just so you know, you too next year can look this cool. That's right. You just have to help. So let us know if you're interested for next year and be praying as the year goes about camp for next year and everything like that. We also had um, two young men at camp this year want to follow Jesus. So. Woo. So as program director, it's my job to help staff the camp. So I uh, pass kind of the buck to these two that they have to help find the staff too. But um, I just want to let you guys know what are roles out there that we're looking for. Um, there's tons of roles and all of these are volunteer. So n no one at our camp is paid. Um, to see the heart of camp of what people want to come up and do is amazing. So we have board members that function throughout the year down here. We have program director, we have quartermaster. Tracy Antosh is our quartermaster and she has to deal with all the ordering of food. Two staff camps that when you have 43 kids, you have about 30 staff members at least. So you're feeding 70 people at one camp. That's a lot to do. We have head cooks, we have regular cooks, we have dishwashers, counselors, deans, people who lead music, rec, nurse, caretaker. Um, we have bus driver needs and we need more bus drivers. So if you have a CDL, we would love to talk to you to see if we can figure out how to get CDL with passenger and air or whatever we need to because we need these roles so desperately. A bus driver is not up there 24 seven. A bus driver that we need right now is just to bus them up the hill and back down. It's on the weekends. Um, we also created a role for bus monitor this year. We would like to have an adult be the bus monitor to help check kids in and off so it's off the bus driver. When you're driving, you shouldn't have to be responsible for counting which kids have to get off at what stop. So if you're willing to just sit on the bus on Saturday and Sunday, we could really use you. Um, we also have our speakers and our missionaries. So it's a great group of staff that come up and it's a wonderful time. I'm kind of going to piggyback on what Megan did. If you helped at camp at all, if you've been a staff member at camp ever, would you please stand up and we just want to see ever. the heart of people who have worked at camp in this church. Thank you. And then at, at middle school, we had 68 campers this year. So we had a full middle school camp. So our kitchen staff, they were rock stars. Um, we were planning on around 45 or 50. We had 68. And then on top of that, another 30 or 40 for staff. So they were feeding 107 to 110 people per meal. Um, but just uh, it's amazing to watch them just enjoy their time um, from dishwashers up to head cook. They, they find ways to just make it incredibly fun. So um, it's also a ministry opportunity. We will have kids that want to serve at camp. And so um, the young teenagers can start their, their time of service at camp in the kitchen. And that's how they, they learn responsibility. They get ministered to by the cooks. Um, it's, you get to minister for wherever you're at at camp. Um, our caretaker positions all over the place. Um, out of those 68, we had three kids that uh, recommitted. Um, we had one of our counselors up there uh, that just got baptized just a couple weeks ago. Michael Taron was also um, up there at camp and then a camper at high school camp. So a lot of times they'll, they'll help, um, be campers at high school camp and then they come back through and they're counselors or, or dishwashers or helpers in the kitchen somewhere else at other camps. So it's just a wonderful time to watch God work. And then at high school camp, we had 48 campers. Um, and so again, that's a boost from last year. Uh, we had Centennial Baptist and, um, and Canyon Springs that provided a lot of volunteers, um, helpers with uh, work camp and counselors and everything. And then this last week, I got to touch base again with our Centennial campers. I got to go do their senior high retreat up at Quaker Hill. And um, just a blessing to get, to, to get other youth groups involved. We go and do um, youth meetings with them throughout the year. Uh, we're going to have a reunion sometime in November, I believe, for camp so that the kids can see each other again. Counselors can check in, pray with them. But uh, just be in prayer over the year. This is whenever we, we, we try and get our staff lined up by December, January, because summer schedule gets set up quickly. So just be in prayer for how you could be used at camp as well and for the, the campers as they go through their school year that the, the messages would stay with them. Thank you so much. We want to turn our eyes to our Savior, Jesus Christ, and this is Communion Sunday, 
And so we're focusing in on the cross of Christ and what it means for us. As we think about that, I want to share with you Psalm 121 before we pray. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Let's seek the Lord together in prayer. Would you bow with me? Lord, we lift up our eyes to the hills. You are where our help comes from. You are the maker of heaven and earth. We look to you, Lord, because you are our helper. You are our shepherd. You are our rock, our guide, our protection. And so I pray, Father, that we would trust in you for who you are and what you have already said you would provide. Well, Lord, let us not waver in our trust in you. Let us not be guided by fear. Let us be guided by faith in you. And I pray, Lord, that um, as we live this life as people who are sojourners and pilgrims, that you would help us, Lord, because we, we feel the pain of our sinful world. When we, when we have an election year like this and we have so much chaos going on around us and we have the increase of the desire for sin and things that offend you, Lord, it grieves us. And so, Lord, we want to express that grief to you, Lord, that we are grieved as we live in this world. We are grieved by what we see around us, Lord. And I pray that as we are, that you would give us patience, Lord, because you have decided to wait to, um, to have Jesus come back. And so you have a purpose for us here. As we grieve, as we struggle, I pray, Lord, that you would give us the spiritual power to be able to do what you've called us to do here, Lord, to fulfill our mission, to be lights in a dark place. Lord, the world has been dark since the very beginning, Lord, after the first sin. And so, Lord, we know that the, the, the darkness that we see now is, is what's been going on for thousands of years. So, Lord, let us take this moment and this time in our lives and live for you and for you alone. May we dedicate ourselves to the mission of the gospel, that it is the only hope for salvation that this world has. Let us believe that, Lord God that all other false messiahs and all other false gospels fail, Lord, and they are not worth our time. Lord, you alone are the one we should focus on. And Lord, I pray for those in our congregation who are struggling with physical issues. Um, I pray uh, for those who have had surgery this week for a good recovery for their joints and the issues that they had surgery for. Pray for Steve, Lord, as he's probably going, uh, undergoing heart surgery right now. Um, and so I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just be with the doctors as they care for him. Pray for those among us who are struggling with long-term diseases and issues, Lord God, that you would build them up and lift them up in your name, giving them your grace. And let us as a congregation be a blessing to them. Lord, I pray for your word this morning, that as it is preached, as it is taught in Sunday school classes, to the children on up, Lord, that we would be faithful in what is taught today, Lord, that we would um, use this time to become prepared to go out into the world as your ambassadors and as fishers of men. Teach us, Lord, today how to fish. Equip us, Lord, with the right fishing poles and the lures so that we could go out and bring people in, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. would you please stand with me as we read God's word? This morning, we have a new verse of the month, Romans 12, 1, probably one that we are fairly familiar with, and we're going to be going through this in a, as a sermon here soon. Uh, and this is our prayer, that we would become living sacrifices, giving ourselves to Christ every day. So would you read with me? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, Romans 12, 1. Now, would you take a moment and greet people around you?
church let's regather and continue to worship the lord if you can find your seats our first hymn this morning is hymn number eight praise to the lord god almighty This morning is found in Revelation 15, 3 through 4. Let's read that together. Great and amazing are all your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. Revelation 15. Three, three, four. 
of our hearts and the grace we need to know that you are with us. May these times of knowing always be confirmed in your word as a promise that you will never leave us, you'll never forsake us. You are a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Children are being dismissed for Children's Church, and I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Matthew 13. Today we are talking about our role as the Church of Jesus Christ. This Sunday and next Sunday, we'll be spending this Sunday in Matthew and next Sunday in Matthew. And, um, and so this is a time where we get to focus in on our mission and what God has called us to be and to do. And today we're looking at the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And so there are really two parts to this. It starts in verse 24 and goes to verse 30, and then Jesus um, talks a little bit more about the parables and then about prophecy, and then he goes on and explains the, the parable, and we'll go ahead and look at that passage as well. And one thing that is clear in Matthew 13 is that the parables were meant to veil the truth to unbelievers and to expose the truth to those who really had an ear to hear. Those who really were listening with faith were the ones who were supposed to be able to get the parables. And what you'll find today is that the confusion about the parables still exists. There is a lot of confusion, and this particular parable 
may have some of the most um, different and various interpretations of all the parables. And this message from Jesus um, may not be confusing. Maybe we'll get to the end of this. But if, if it's not confusing, once we get to the end, the question is, is it something that we can accept? Is the parable of the wheat and the weeds something that we want to accept and um, to embrace? Because it holds the key to understanding our place in this world as the church and where we get our hope from, what we're, what we're really hoping happens. Um, but I will tell you this, being as key as this parable is to understand our purpose, it's not always the message that we want. You see, the message of this passage is pretty simple. That we are to be preaching and patient in a wheat, in a weedy world. We are supposed to be wheat that preaches and waits, and we, be, and we are surrounded by the weeds in a difficult place in the world. And so both preaching the gospel and being patient are not usually the ways that we think about making changes in this world. We want to make an impact now. We want to make an impact that is obvious and that has visible results. But, but if we take a message like this, that we are to preach and wait for, for the end, which is the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, is, is that enough? Brothers and sisters, is that enough for us? You see, many believers have grown impatient with this truth and turned to other means besides the gospel to change the world around them. And so the question is, is this right or is this wrong? What should we be doing, brothers and sisters, in this world? What is our role? Why does God have us here? Why has Jesus waited to come a second time? The key is in the parable of the wheat and the weed. So let's find out what he's talking about. First, we're going to talk about the parable, then we're going to talk about the explanation. So as we begin with the parable, we look at verse 24. It reads, he put another parable before them. So he goes on and says this, the kingdom of heaven. Now I want to stop there. When Matthew um, describes Jesus' words as the kingdom of heaven, he uses the same term in um, the other gospels to talk about the kingdom of God. And so the kingdom of heaven is essentially the kingdom of God. It's a, it's a kingdom that comes from heaven. It's a kingdom that's associated with heaven, which is the abode of God himself. And so this is a parable about the kingdom. Now what is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven is God's rule over his subjects. So this is any place that God rules over his subjects. And the kingdom of God has taken various forms over time. And this parable includes a parable about both the kingdom and also how it functions within the world. How does the kingdom function in the world? And he gives us three parts to this parable. The first, and, 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 and we get to the first, which is the scenario. So we got to start with the scenario of this parable, of this story, so we understand it. You see, whenever my kids come to me and they run up to me and say, so-and-so hit me. I don't just automatically assume that that kid was doing the right thing and that the other kid was doing the wrong thing. I have to learn the scenario. I have to become an investigator and find out, why did they hit you? Well, you know, I called them a name. Okay, why did, why did you call them a name? Well, they were picking on me. Why were they picking on you? Because I was picking on them. And we got to do this whole thing and unpack the scenario to figure out the truth. And so in this parable, we need to find out the scenario. And there are really three parts to this scenario that, that Jesus wants us to know to set the context to be able to give us his truth. So the first is this. In this scenario, a farmer plants a crop of wheat. Verse 24. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. So we have here a farmer. And he goes out and he, with intention, plants good seed into the ground. And this is a very common action for a man who desired to do a good thing by providing food for himself and for others. We would always, I think, look at a farmer who planted seed in his field as a good thing in society, that they were always intending it to be good and intending to benefit many people. This decision would also require a lot of work from the farmer. 
They would have to take care. They would have to give an investment financially. And, and it shows the purpose of the farmer, which is to give food and produce food for other people. So we can just automatically assume in the scenario that the farmer has good intention. The farmer has a field. It's his field. And he plants good things in it. Plants good seed. The second part of the scenario is that an enemy comes into the field and puts weed seed in the field secretly, verse 25. But while his men were sleeping, that's his workers, his enemy came and sowed wheat or weeds among the wheat and went away. So in this scenario, we see here that there's another character who comes in. It's the enemy of the farmer. And the enemy of the farmer comes in and, he, and he's got a bunch of seed, but he's got weed seed. And he goes out, and he goes, hey, you can just see him kind of going, hey, 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 hey you know, I'm going to really mess with our, the farmer. I, and, and, and so we get this impression, like, this guy really hates the farmer, because he goes at night while his men are sleeping, which is fine, they're sleeping, anybody would, and, and it's a secret thing he does, and he throws weed seed all over this fertile ground that has been already planted with wheat seed. Now, the question automatically becomes, um, do you think this really happens in real life? Would somebody actually go and, and at, at night go throw weed into your crops? Well, apparently it happens so often in the Roman world that they actually had to pass a law that actually basically um, put people in jail if they ever did this. So it happened enough to where they had to pass a law to say, don't go to somebody else's field and throw weed seed all over the place. And what it was intended to do was devastate the work of the fellow farmer and bring him ruin. It was intended to ruin the farmer because if he can't have a crop, then he can't feed his family and potentially would have to give up his land. And maybe he would do this to get the land. We could think about it like that, that possibly this would be a neighbor who's like, I want to get your land. I want you to sell it to me. So I'm going to throw weed seed in here so that you can't get a crop. You go bankrupt and then I can buy your property cheap. So we have this enemy doing this work. But here's the most surprising part of the scenario, which is the third one, verse 26. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. So we see here this field where we see wheat is growing up, and at the same time, weeds are growing up as well. And most people think that the type of weeds that are growing up are what's called darnel. And darnel, as it is maturing, looks just like wheat. So they are indistinguishable until they both bear fruit, which is very interesting if you look at the parable of the sower. But in this case, we see here that both the wheat and the weeds are growing up, and the farmer would know it. He would think that this is going to be a great harvest until the kernels pop up, and then all of a sudden you can see that there is wheat everywhere in this field. It's important to note as well that Darnell is poisonous to wheat. So not only is the wheat growing, and it's taking the incredibly important good nutrients that the wheat needs to grow healthily, but it's also, it's, it's poisoning the wheat. So, so the weeds are, are doing a terrible thing here at this point. And if left alone, the whole crop could be contaminated. So, so the main point so far, brothers and sisters, is this. In this scenario, we see here that, that because the enemy has planted weeds in the field, that the crop is facing potential failure that somebody would look at the situation and they would go, all is lost. The farmer has been had. The farmer has been defeated because the weeds have grown up. And as we know, as what weeds do, they take over. And so the wheat are, are going to be possibly taken over as well. And it's a crop failure. And I just want to stop here at this moment because we know that this is a parable about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. So this is a point oftentimes where people look at this and they apply it to the Christian life. And they would agree with the basic conclusion, which is that there's a crop failure. In other words, a lot of people look at the church today, the church today, and they look at the world around the church, and they look at how bad things are and how evil is growing and how difficult it is to basically influence the culture and the society around us. And they look around and they've come to this conclusion. The church is entering into crop failure. The church will fail because the world has won. 
People worry that the weeds will finally choke out all the wheat or that the proximity of believers to the world will cause the believers to cave into the temptations of the world rather than the believers having a deep influence on the unbelievers because the question is, who's influencing who here if the wheat and the wheat are growing up together? Brothers and sisters, these are all legitimate concerns. We've all probably had those same concerns. We've all probably thought about that and said, said, how can we as a church expand the kingdom when we're surrounded by so much worldliness and sin? But here's the question we need to ask. This is the question that the parable answers. Will God allow crop failure? Will God allow crop failure? Because so many times we look at it as humans that we need to solve this problem of worldliness creeping into the church. But I think we missed the bigger question is, what will God do about this? So we need to keep that in our minds. The second part beyond this scenario is the sinister plot. What, what, what's going on here? And so we have the servants asking a question in verse 27. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to a master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? Okay, so this is a, this is a very obvious question. If, if you, master, if you have actually intended for good crops, if you have intended this thing to be good, and you planted good wheat, and nothing but messed up weeds has grown in the midst of it, how did this happen? When you're good, how did this bad thing happen? Many people ask this question about God. If he created a good creation, how did it go bad so quickly? Verse 28, and he said to them, an enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. So, so the farmer says, this was not my doing. I did not intend to have weeds. I didn't mistakenly plant wheat and weeds together. It was planted by an enemy. It's not his fault, in other words. It's the fault of his enemy. And the enemy wants to destroy all the good things that the farmer had intended. And so what we see here is that, is that the, the helpers of the farmer understand that there's a battle going on between the farmer and the enemy. And the enemy is, is, is look, looking out to destroy the farmer. And the way the enemy is trying to destroy the farmer is by destroying his crop. We can apply this to our own lives, can't we? That there is a cosmic battle going on between God and Satan. And the play, playing field is the earth. The cosmic battle that's going on between them is playing out in our lives, in Caldwell, in Idaho, in the United States, in the world, in front of our very eyes. We are watching the cosmic battle take place. There is an enemy. He is your enemy. And he wants to take you down. And so he's planting weeds all around you, influencing them to influence you. So there's a sinister plot at work here. But what's fascinating about this story, we all know this, don't we? What's fascinating is the strategy. Because here Jesus gives us God's strategy in the scenario, in the situation. What would God do about this? Second half of verse 28. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? Do you know what, you know what they mean? Let's just take out the whole crop. Let's ruin it. Let's till it under. It's done. Let's get rid of the wheat and the weeds together. It's a failed crop. Let's give up on the whole thing. And that's the logical conclusion that anybody would deduce. If your field is full of weeds, it's, it's a bum, bum crop. It's going to fail. So why don't we cut our losses now? Why don't we plant a new field? And let's go with that. And it's shocking what ends up happening. But before we get to that point, let's think about this. If we were to apply this to the church today, many people over time, not just at this time, but many people over time have had the same reaction. They say, Lord, the world is so messed up, it cannot be purified, therefore, just take it out. Uh, this was kind of, in a smaller way, seen by the sons of thunder. Remember the sons of thunder, James and John, and, and Jesus was trying to go to a Samaritan town, and they would not receive him. And so they said, Lord, should we just call down some fire from heaven and burn all these folks? Let's just burn them all. And so that was their plan. They're like, you know, Lord, the, all these people that reject you, just take them out. 
Just get rid of them. And, and there's a tendency amongst the people of God to want that. And, and there's a natural good tendency because we know that at the end that's going to happen. So some people just want it now. And what did Jesus say? He says, he rebuked them. And said, and said, men, that is not the answer. The answer is not to destroy the field and wipe out everybody. The farmer decides to do something shocking. Verse 30, or excuse me, verse 29. But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn. This is the strategy of God in the world. He wants to leave the wheat among the weeds. And he will leave the wheat among the weeds until final judgment when Jesus comes back. Now this isn't the final, final judgment, but we know that Jesus is coming in the day of the Lord. And it is then, and only then, will he separate the wheat from the weeds? And so we can easily conclude at that point that then God's intention is exactly what we see. We, God has wheat living among the weeds for a reason, because he wants us to. So the corrupted crop was not the doing of the farmer, but the enemy of the farmer. The enemy's plan would be foiled in the end because the farmer was st- would still be able to gather a crop. You see, what the farmer is saying is, I don't want to start new. I want these wheat, but I'm going to allow these wheat to grow up with the weeds because the enemy is still trying to win. But in the end, I will win because I will separate the wheat from the weeds and I'll still get my crop. This is the heart of God for you, brothers and sisters. For all intents and purposes, God should wipe out Caldwell immediately because of the sin of the people. Burn us all. But God has allowed us to remain mixed with everybody else until Jesus comes back. And that's the life we live in. And that's how God wins because he will leave us here and he knows he will still get his wheat out of it. In other words, the church will never fail because Even though he leaves the wheat out there, we will survive. We will remain. So the strategy is to let the wheat and the weeds grow together until the harvest in order to save the wheat because the enemy is still working against the wheat in this world. Now, many people think that this parable is actually talking about um, the church, that, that in the church are wheat and weeds and that um, they are indistinguishable until judgment. As, as a matter of fact, most of the commentaries I read came to this conclusion. They said that this parable is about the church, and that the church is supposed to be full of people who are believers and unbelievers, and, and they are indistinguishable until the coming of Christ. So in other words, the real message here they're saying is that we need to tolerate a mixed church of wheat and weeds, and so we should not seek to purify the church. God will do that. Even Warren Wiersbe said, uh, we are not detectives, but evangelists. So we're not supposed to be detectives on who the real Christians are in the church. That's, that's, that, that's been a common interpretation of this passage for many, many years. And they get this interpretation from the statement where Jesus said that the, the kingdom of heaven is like. So they're saying, if the, the kingdom of heaven is like this, then what they're saying is that the field or the, wor- or, 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 or the, the, the place where everything is planted is the church. So they believe that the field is the church. And so in the church grows wheat and weeds. And then they would even say that then Satan has planted unbelievers in the church to ruin it, but that's not going to ultimately ruin it. And so the question is, is that what's going on here? Is this really just telling us that, there are, that the church is mixed believers and unbelievers? And, um, and so we're not supposed to do church discipline and we're not supposed to um, identify who the Christians are. Well, thankfully, Jesus told us the meaning of this parable. And so really, if we look at the meaning, I think we'll understand what it's saying. So let's move on from the parable to the explanation. There are really two points here. This is the explanation of what it is. The first is the current strategy for the church, and the second is the future hope of the church. So let's talk about the current strategy of the church, starting in verse 36. 
Who is the farmer? Verse 36. He starts, Jesus starts identifying who the people are in this parable. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds and the field. Because they didn't understand it. So he goes, they go into the house, and he goes, okay, I'm going to tell you. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. So the good farmer is Jesus, and he's sowing the seed. And what, what seed does Jesus sow? The gospel. And by sowing the seeds of the gospel, um, it creates believers. And so, so he's the one who brings the gospel, which creates believers, um, and that's what the good farmer is doing. He's essentially um, the preacher and the producer of the gospel. He creates the gospel because he dies on the cross for our sins, and he also preached it so that we might believe it. So the man, the farmer, is the son of man. So the, the, the big question is, what's the field? Verse 38, the field is the world. Brothers and sisters, Jesus told us what the field is. The field is not the church. The field is the world. And what he means in that sense is that it's not just the fleshly organization of humanity, though that is part of the world. It's simply this, the earth. So this parable is telling us about the kingdom of God and how it operates in the earth. Brothers and sisters, there are some churches that do think that the church is supposed to consist of wheat and weeds, that, that the field is the church. They do believe that those who love Jesus and those who will not bow the knee to Jesus should be serving in church together, worshiping together, and live as one. Now, brothers and sisters, that's, we're not, that's not saying the same thing as inviting visitors and having people come to our church to explore Christ. That's, we are so welcome you to come and be here. If you don't know Christ, as a visitor, we are glad you are here. But what I'm talking about is something different. This, this is the belief that uh, the church is believers and unbelievers, just gathered together. That's, that's what this perspective is. So churches that believe this remove all distinguishing marks of believers. They remove things like membership. They remove things like church discipline. They frown upon distinguishing who the people of God are. And they decide, let's just get a bunch of people in the room who are here for various and sundry reasons, and that's called the church. And so they apply this passage to say there's wheat and weeds, and we're supposed to be together, and we're not supposed to do anything about it until Jesus comes back. But brothers and sisters, this interpretation, to not see the, the, the field as the world, and to see the church as the field, result, results in worldliness. It results in the church looking like the world. Because if everybody's commingled in the church, then we're commingling sacred and secular together in lifestyle and worship. Brothers and sisters, instead of that, this is teaching about the church in the world, not the world in the church. So we, we see here that this is a parable about the world and how the wheat grows up in the world and the weeds grow up in the world and they're all, they're all intermingled. So let's see what the good seed is. Number three. The good seed is the sons of the kingdom. It says the field in verse 38 is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. These are the people that are planted by Jesus on the earth by the Son of Man and, and the one he, ones he wants to grow. These are the believers in Jesus. As Jesus said in John 1, 12 through 13, or it said, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Who are the sons of God? Those who are not born by blood or uh, the will of the flesh, but born of God. These are the sons of the kingdom. And they are not from a particular nation. They're not from a particular place. They're not from a particular culture. It includes everyone in the world who believes in Jesus. And this comprises the church in the last days all those who have become the children of God by being born again in Jesus Christ. Jesus' definition, brothers and sisters, of the church is all those who believe in his name and are born again. Thus, in this passage, he cannot be referring to the visible church. The visible church are those who gathered. That's not, the, what, that's not what this parable is trying to, to describe. The church in mind here, the wheat here, the, the, the sons of God here, is the invisible church. These are interspersed within the world and are not all gathered in one location, though we gather in churches regularly on Sundays. 
And this is, this is vital to understand because if the church is a mixture of regenerate and unregenerate, then there can be no way to identify who the church really is. So let me just describe to you what Al Mohler uh, talks about in his book about this pa parable uh, as he defines what the church is. I think he has a great definition of what the church is. This is the wheat. This is who the wheat are. Quote, the church is to be made up of professing believers, professing believers, that means public profession, who are gathered together in a covenant of mutual accountability that we commit to one another in accountability to the Lord Jesus Christ, displaying the kingdom of God on earth until it is fully realized when Christ returns. So we are showing Christ through the gospel in our lives and through our words, responsible for stewarding the truth, ministering the gospel, and exercising church discipline for the increasing holiness of believers. That's the definition of the church. And brothers and sisters, you will not see in here a social agenda. You will not see in here the transformation of culture by passing new laws. This is what the church is. The church is the wheat, the people who are born again, whose job it is to worship the Lord, serve the Lord, fellowship together, and display the gospel. That's it. That's the purpose of the church. And brothers and sisters, this is vital point because the Jews, and Jesus is talking to the Jews here, they did not think of themselves as people who were displaying Christ out there in the world, interspersed with the people of the world. The Jewish people thought of the kingdom of God as a fortress. The nation of Israel was a fortress in a sea of paganism. They thought that all the believers in God would gather in one nation and that they would be the faithful and that they could, they could live both civilly, socially, and religiously sold out for God and that they could be a fortress that would protect themselves from the world around them. They didn't see themselves as needing to incorporate out there. They were a fortress. And so, brothers and sisters, Jesus is working against that mentality. This parable keeps us from having a fortress mentality that we can create a pure nation or local enclaves that stand outside of the world around, that build walls and don't let the world in anywhere, and we can have a perfect little heaven on earth here. Jesus is pushing us outside that comfort zone and says, you need to be out there in the world, ministering the gospel and being patient and waiting for people to get saved. Jesus, did he, did he not pray for the disciples that they would not be taken out of the world, but they would be faithful in the world? In the book of John. So this is the wheat. The wheat, the good seed, are the sons of the kingdom. And, and that's who we're called to be. Not a, not a fortress, but a group of people that are out there interspersed in the world. And who are the weeds? The weeds, it goes on to say, are the sons of the evil one. Verse 38, all those who do not believe in Christ as Lord and Savior, that's who this means. Now, it's offensive to hear that unbelievers are sons of the evil one, and I want to be really, really careful here. This does not mean that unbelievers are knowingly serving Satan or that they are Satan worshipers. What it means is that Satan is the invisible power that is running all non-Christian organizations and systems according to his mission to thwart the authority and salvation of God. And that the people of this world, oftentimes unwittingly, have just fallen into his design and fallen into his authority and leadership. Most of the time, unwitting followers. But, but the Bible makes it very clear that either you're in the realm of God and you're serving in his kingdom, or you're just out there in the realm of Satan where he can push you around and, and guide you and lead you, whether or not you even know it. And one could even say this, if that's the case, if the weeds are the sons of the evil one, then the weeds outnumber the wheat. We as wheat in this world will always be outnumbered. Because we know that the, the road to destruction is broad and wide, but the road to eternal life is narrow. And who is the enemy? Verse 39. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So we know that the enemy is the devil. He's working against God to make the earth a pure, holy place, 
a habitation for pure and holy people. The devil is working against all of that. He wants it to be a place that rebels against God, a place that destroys families, a place that destroys individuals, a place that destroys good relationships, especially the ones that lead people to Christ. That's what the enemy is doing. And what is the harvest? What, what, when does this end come? Brothers and sisters, this is vitally important. The end comes at the end of the age. The end of the age. This refers to the judgment upon Jesus' return. We call this the second coming of the Lord. It's part of the day of the Lord. And then lastly, we have servants here, and that's the angels who gather up people for judgment. So as we look at this parable, I want to leave you with a couple of application points. We're going somewhere with this, brothers and sisters. First is this. We cannot purify the world, only the church. We cannot purify the world, only the church. We must remember our job to evangelize the lost so that they may enter the church and then be purified. Jesus, or it says in Titus 2.14, Jesus who gave himself to us for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Who will be zealous for good works? Who will be purified? Only those who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. If you want to change the world around you, lead people to Christ. That is the only way. Cannot purify the world. We can only purify the church. And so we're not to eliminate ourselves from being around other people. It talks about this in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10. It talks about uh, what, what would it be like if you, if you said, I can never be around unbelievers because they're unbelievers. He talks about sinful people in the church. He's talking about purifying the church. And he says this, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Isn't that interesting? Paul says, do not associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. Since then, you would need to get out of the world. He says, if you, if you determine that you're not going to hang around with any sinners, then you got to get out of the world because they're everywhere. You purify the church. Church is to be pure for people to, a place where people can escape that life and enter into a life of holiness. Brothers and sisters, we are to be salt in the world, but the salt we have is the gospel. We are to be light in the world, but it's the light of the gospel. Goodness matters in the world. We, we must see our good deeds in the world as, as, as serving a primary purpose, though, of spreading the gospel. Brothers and sisters, once we try to live our lives to make a good society that has no more sexual perversions, no more abusive people, no more homelessness, no more addictions, if we are focused on doing those things, we are ultimately saying the gospel is unnecessary. We are saying that the gospel is an addition to curing the social ills instead of the only cure. Because if the gospel is the only cure, then it's the only tool we must use. Am I right? This is, does not mean we don't support doing good in our society. We have to see ourselves as two kingdom people. The broader circle is the kingdom of this world where we are citizens of the United States of America. The inner circle is the citizenship of the kingdom of God. The inner circle of the kingdom of God is a higher allegiance to all other allegiances. It doesn't mean you don't have other allegiances. It just means that the, the allegiance to the kingdom of God is utmost and whatever God calls us to do, we do. And we know this, the purpose of the church, of the wheat, is to be in the world portraying Christ through our words and our actions. And that that is the purpose but we all just understand this, that we are citizens of this world. And as a citizen of this world, you can be a healthcare professional. You can be a police officer. You can do things that help benefit this world and, and help this world grow. But when you do that, you must understand the difference to your primary purpose, which is to preach the gospel. And know this, that at the end of the day, making society better will not lead more people to heaven. Only the gospel will. And we're playing the long game, brothers and sisters. And that's what Jesus is saying. Play the long game. 
We preach and we wait. J. Vernon McGee. It was so funny, somebody asked me the other day, was J. J. Vernon McGee, was he like orthodox? Was he like a solid Christian? It's like, yeah, he's pretty good. (laughs) Pretty solid. He said this, our job as a church is not to clean up the pond, it's to get the fish out of the pond. And I I think this is so important for us today because um, we are all getting tempted, I think, to try to find other ways to make the world better and we're ignoring the gospel. The second point I wanna make is this. The church must live in the world until the final judgment. We must live in the world until the final judgment. We cannot become a fortress. The fortress mentality must be eradicated from our thinking. We have to be willing to enter the world and be around the people of the world. If God did not want us in the world, he would have taken us out of the world, but he left us here not to hide out, He left us here to get out into the world. How to supply to the church. Brothers and sisters, this will hopefully help you. The church is not a fortress. The church is a harbor. And and, and think about it like this. We believers are a fishing boat. The church is the harbor in a tumultuous sea. God wants us out there in the sea catching fish. And once or twice a week, he wants you to come back to harbor after you've been beat up all week, get painted, get some repairs, fuel up, and then head back out. That's what the church is. The church is a temporary harbor for you to come back and get fed and built up and lifted up and encouraged and then to be sent back out there. We are not to remain in the harbor. We are not to say, you know what, those seas are too rough. I'm just gonna hang out here and I'm not going back out to sea. We are a harbor, not a fortress. And lastly, the church must wait to see evil extinguished until, the, until Christ's judgment. We are called to wait until the very end, and only in the second coming of Christ will evil be dealt with. Brothers and sisters, this is why this is so important. If you believe in the second coming of Christ, and you believe it is only then that evil will be dealt with and eradicated, then you know you can't do it now. You know that it's the future you're looking for. It's the, it, you're not trying to create heaven on earth now. You're looking for heaven on earth really when Jesus comes back. I think that this is one of the biggest things that's happened to the church these days, is that we have gotten to a point where we want heaven now, not in, in some earthly form, some human form, rather than the kingdom that's coming the millennial reign that Christ is gonna set up. If you look at hymnals from the past, you'll see that they sang about the millennial reign constantly. They were looking for the second coming of Christ. And have we lost sight of that? Have we gotten so frustrated with the world around us that we say, you know, I've had enough. I'm I'm gonna change this world around me right now. I'm not waiting for Jesus, I'm doing it myself. The ultimate point of Jesus is saying is this, you cannot fix this world, only Jesus can. Let's read it. Verse 40, just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. Brothers and sisters, that will not happen until the end. We cannot get this done now. We cannot get this done on our own. This has to happen when Jesus returns. When he comes and he gathers all these people. Verse 42, he throws them into the fiery furnace, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's referring to hell here, eternal damnation. And then, and only then, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. If you can hear what this is saying, Jesus is saying this, sin will finally be eradicated, sin will finally be dealt with and done only when Jesus comes back, and then, When the world is purified, he will set up his earthly reign, and the righteous, you brothers and sisters, will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. You will be in the kingdom here on earth. You will shine like the sun. It used to be that we were lights in the darkness. Now we'll be lights in the light. 
Just like when the sun comes up in the morning and the darkness covers the land and it starts slowly exposing what's there, but then once it gets to high noon, everything is exposed to the sunlight and we live in light. That is when it happens, the second coming of Christ. It will not happen before. So brothers and sisters, I encourage you with this. We must quit looking to temporary purifications of society and temporary course corrections. We can still do it, but they, that is not the final answer. That is not the final solution. These adjustments will only serve to be temporary as Satan will always turn our good deeds and the, and the good deeds of men into evil. The enemy will always be turning these things into those things. He will always always twist it. He will always corrupt the good things that are happening. You will find that if you become a warrior for justice or you become a warrior for, for, for whatever change you want to bring in society, Satan will always thwart that effort to some degree. He will always twist it and corrupt it. And so then we have to say there is only one answer to society's problems. It's the second coming of Christ. And what are we to do? Here's the final application, brothers and sisters. Grow where you're planted. Jesus planted you here. Some of you moved because God led you here. Sometimes God moves you. But wherever he puts you, he wants you there. Notice, the farmer put the seeds in the field exactly where he wanted them. So the final point is that we are to grow where we're planted. We are to, we are to impact where we are with the gospel of Christ. That's what we can do. We are to preach and be patient amongst the weeds where we are planted. Instead of quit looking for the perfect location, quit looking for the perfect place. There is no perfect place. The whole field is full of weeds. Everywhere you go. We cannot look for utopia on earth, brothers and sisters. We have to wait for the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm going to close with a uh, well-known hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Jesus is the one who will fix this world, brothers and sisters. Let's pray for that to come soon. Lord Jesus, we pray to you today. We don't know when you're coming, but we hold out hope that you are the one who will make all things right, that the work that was begun on the cross will be completed in the consummation of the kingdom, that we long for the kingdom to come. We long for the kingdom to be on this earth. We long for sin to be eradicated and the reign of Jesus to be here, visible and experienced. Lord, let us hold to that truth and to that day. Lord, you've got us here as citizens of this earth to do some good here, but Lord, let us not look at that as the ultimate fix, but you and you alone. And so, Lord, um, we pray that it would be soon. We pray, Lord, that we would see it soon. And until that time, Lord, may we, may, may we wait patiently. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. of Jesus, how he, as a good shepherd, went in t to find the lost sheep. He, he left the fold safely, and he went and found the lost sheep, the black sheep, and that's the heart of Jesus. You know, um, today's, is it more Memorial Day weekend? Right, La Labor Day? Okay, good. I was, I get those two mixed up all the time. <laughs> um, well, it is Memorial Day in a sense because uh, we're, communion is a memorial. Uh, a memorial is when we remember somebody who passed away, remember the good things they did. And so communion is a memorial. Jesus said, uh, do these things in remembrance of me. And um, some of the things he did, I just, uh, when I read some of these things he did, uh, I read this this week, he gave up everything that we might gain everything. He was condemned that we might be justified. 
He suffered shame that we might be honored. He paid the price that we might have a free gift. He was cursed that we might be blessed. He was wounded that we might be healed. He was punished that we might be pardoned. He was broken that we might be made whole. He bore God's anger that we might bask in God's love. He became poor that we might become rich. He became sin for us that we might become his righteousness. He died that we might live. When I think about that he died that we might live, I I do think about what Jesus said when he talked about being a a good shepherd. You know, uh, John chapter 10 uh, says, uh, the verse 10, it says, "The the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I came that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. That's interesting, Ratatry said that. He says, I am the good shepherd. Uh, The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And the first thing he thinks of when he thinks of a good shepherd, he thinks of a shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. And uh, that's what Jesus did as our shepherd. we need a shepherd, right? We have all gone astray. The Bible says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, and sin separates us from God. That's, that's what happens when we sin. We, we can't have a relationship with God anymore. Sin separates us from God. So Jesus died for our sins that we might have the relationship with God that, that we need and that we cherish. He dies uh, like the good shepherd was willing to die for the sheep. I don't know if you, uh, he, he's, and he says it, uh, I would, that I come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. Now, in the context of the shepherd dying for the sheep, I think, what does he mean? I know that we can interpret this as that we will be blessed with a lot of things. And uh, it can be misinterpreted to say we, we should be prosperous and have lots of money. And I don't think that's evil. But I really don't think this, that's what this is talking about. He's talking about providing generously for the sheep. And, uh, you know, it's not life you know, like a heart that pumps blood, our lungs that breathe air, our stomachs that digest food. It's not that kind of life that God brings us. Jesus brought us. He brings us spiritual life. And that's life with a capital L uh, and a capital I and a capital F and a capital E. It's amazing life because that's a life with a relationship with Jesus Christ. What an awesome privilege it is for us to have a relationship with our creator, with the God of the universe. That's life. That's amazing. And he is a good shepherd. He provides for our needs. He will do anything to take care of his sheep. That's that's wonderful. But he, he died for us to take care of it. Now, the neat thing is he also rose again, proving that he was God. Um, so this morning, as we, um, as we take communion, I'd like to encourage us to think about our shepherd who died for our sins because we have that tendency to stray. We need a Savior to save us from our sins so that we might be able to be reconciled to God and have that relationship with God our, our creator and our savior. Um, so um, let's, let's think about that this morning as we, as, we, um, as we share the bread and cup. So I'm gonna pray that the ushers can come forward if they want. Gracious Heavenly Father, we, as we pr- prepare our hearts for uh, taking uh, communion, uh, we wanna thank you for being our good shepherd who was willing to do everything, who left heaven, emptied himself of heaven, became a man, became a servant, and died a death 
even the death on the cross, because that would accomplish our salvation, our forgiveness and salvation if we believe on Jesus Christ. That would reconcile us to God. I pray that uh, we would just be thankful as we reflect on what Jesus Christ did for us. In Christ's name, amen. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed and uh, went to the cross, he, he took the bread and he, and he blessed it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the, the supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you that you are the good shepherd that you provide for all our needs, 
faithfully. Thank you that you loved us so much that you were willing to die to deal with our sin problem, Lord. We thank you that, you're, that you poured out your, your lifeblood so that we might have life. Lord, we just, um, we thank you that you came, came back to life so that you prove that you were God and so that we could have a relationship with you. Pray that we would just ap- appreciate our relationship with you, our life with a capital L, and uh, just rejoice in our relationship with you that we might become strong in you and rejoice in you and be able to go out and even find lost sheep and black sheep and be able to uh, bring them into the fold. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. As the choir comes back up to, uh, to sing, would you please stand with us as we sing the familiar hymn, Just As I Am, combined with I Come Broken. Just as I am.
to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever and the church said amen amen go and love to serve the Lord God bless you Treasure.